welcome to this week's episode of Life After. Um, I'm Brady Hardy. No, nope, we're gonna. Nope. Chuck. Nope. What, what are you doing? What's going on here? I'm taking over, Brady. This is my episode. I I don't understand. This is a hostile takeover of this episode. Oh my gosh! What are you gonna do? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna interview you, Brady. You're gonna interview me? Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. This is my, it's my turn to interview you. Uh, you always get to you always get to talk to everybody. You know. You need to add the the, the sound of a turntable because the tables have been turned. Oh, <laughs> that was pretty bad. That was bad. Thank you. On this week's episode of The Life After, I'm interviewing Brady Harden. You may have heard a brief synopsis of his story on the first episode, but there is so much more to unpack, and that is what we're up to today. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. And this this is is The the Life Life After. Extra, extra, read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. But um bum And welcome back to uh, the Chuck Parson hostile takeover of the life after. <laughs> I'm tied up here. Like he, I have ropes yeah, actually, around me. Brady's, I can't even move. Brady's yeah. tied to his chair. Um, and he finally took the duct tape off my mouth so I can speak. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking about putting it back, but we'll me, see. Me too. It's all right. <laughs> Brady, you uh, you messaged me this week about uh, a book that you were that you were reading. Yes. It was. Uh, it was. I believe it was Troublemaker uh, by by Leah Remini, right? The the actress from King of Queens. Yes, that's her. Um, I finished it last night. I like to listen to audiobooks and walk around the park. Uh, but I, I Oh, the, so you read it. <laughs> right. <laughs> she read it to me because <laughs> I'm a little dyslexic. I mean if yeah, if if Leah Remney wanted to read me a book, I'd be I'd be okay with it. Would you? Yeah, I'd probably just sit there and I, listen. I get it. She's beautiful. She kinda sounds like a young Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. She's got like that smoker's like where it's kind of like, ooh, that's a little, sexy. a little rasp, a little, a little bit little of rasp. I get it. Cool. Uh, but yeah, her book was amazing. Uh, Troublemaker. It, it was interesting to hear a celebrity's view, um, who's gone through religious trauma syndrome. Um, she of course escaped Scientology. Right. Which um, is crazy. Yeah. And, and it that's was like a, that's like a whole feat in and of itself, you know? Absolutely. Um, well, it's weird cause her deconstruction started at Tom Cruise's wedding. Okay. Um, where like all of these leaders were there. I know, really outra- outrageous. That's incredible. Right? Um, all these Wait, leaders. Which, which Tom Cruise wedding are we talking about? Um, Katie Holmes. Okay, Katie, Katie Holmes. Holmes. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Um, so this is couch jumping Tom Cruise. Yes, okay. uh, and she talks about that in the book too. Uh, but yeah. at that wedding, a lot of the like major higher ups were there. Um, Tom Cruise is treated completely differently, um, as if he is like one of the leaders just because of all the money he gives and the notoriety mm-hmm. that he gives mm-hmm. to, the, to the religion. Um, but anyway, she talks about her entire experience for for like the majority of the book, and at the very end, she kind of gives the the last chapter too is more of like her philosophy of um, here are the things that I learned, here's how I think, this is how I operate now. Okay. And she talked a lot about uh, whenever she did publicly leave the faith, how many people um, in the Hollywood community, including like Jennifer Lopez and Michel Visage and a couple other people, like messaged her. And uh, said that they were there for her, and they mm-hmm. were they were a huge support system for her. And she was on Dancing with the Stars okay. um, after that, and like, would have like emotional breakdowns while practicing. And everybody around her just knew like she's going through this trauma, right? And they were just like really patient with her. And I wow, that was, that's awesome! I thought that was really cool. Really it, was, great. it was encouraging. Did you do you feel like like who were those people in your life when you when you left the faith? <sighs> My friend Adina, yeah, um, Adina, and you know Adina. I do. Um, her and I've been lovely, friends for seventeen person. years. Uh, she's still a Christian, but she was definitely there for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a family that I met through Adina with the last name of the Ramses, um, and I actually it was as I was leaving the faith, I was still going to a Bible study in their house, mm-hmm. um, and I, I don't think that they approve of my homosexuality and all of that, um, which is fine. But I, I, they were still there as emotional support whenever my church kicked me out and I needed a new, a new support system. Yeah. You needed a, you had to build a whole new community. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And I'm yeah. sure that's what uh, that's what Leo was going through as well. And then outside of that, I just kind of had to start over. It felt like right um, until I started reaching out to people like you and and everything through this podcast. Um, but yeah, Leah Remney, she she had a really interesting concept that that really stuck with me, and she used the illustration of Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas, uh-huh. uh, which I've never actually watched all the way through, but I but I, I know enough of the movie to understand the reference. But you know, at first he starts in his Halloween world where everything is on theme for Halloween, and then he finds this other world that's Christmas. And right. so she kind of had to go through that that process of leaving her faith, leaving the Scientology, and um, having her mind and her eyes open to a whole new world. And she had to filter every thought that she had of, is this the thought of a Scientologist? Because so much of their, their religion oh, and faith uh-huh. messes with your intentions and, and everything to an abusive way. I can um, relate to that very much. Right? Or she had a question like, is this a Scientology thought or is this a Leah thought? Right, right, right. Is, um, this a, is this a Christian thought or is this a Chuck thought? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I really related to that and, and I started to think... Um, how similar were our experiences? How similar were our religions? Because we look at something as absurd as, as Scientology, and we know that they're a lot more abusive um, right. up front, and they're they're more clear with what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Whereas with with some of our Christian listeners or other religions who have gone through stuff, it's maybe a little bit more passive aggressive, mm-hmm. maybe not as like cut and dry, black and white. Um, but but I got to thinking like how I, I listened to her story, and I'm like, you know, I really want to meet somebody who escaped Scientology because right. I, I think that that's really intriguing to me. And I know that there's a temple here in St. Louis um, and there, there is a presence. I, I almost, I interviewed at a place to find out was just a front for Scientology. And once no I saw joke. It, yeah, yeah. I, I was in there, they put me in a small room. Like a job interview? Yeah. A job oh. interview. It was a graphic design marketing thing. And uh, when I got in there and I saw the L. Ron Hubbard books, just like mm-hmm. filled, like there's an entire bookshelf and nothing about that. Um, I just, I took the application. I wrote on the back, like, I'm, I'm not going to work for you. And I just, I left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know that there's people here in St. Louis that have gone through that. I'm like, I really want to meet somebody like that. Mm-hmm. But then it hit me like, with people who weren't brought up in the same context in the same environment as me, that's probably how they view me of like, how could he have been so foolish to fall for that? Um, or like how, like how different is his life or, you know, how did he, you know, just allow, right, allow right. himself how, to yeah, take how it. did Yeah. 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 I can, yeah, no, for sure. So I started to compare like their beliefs and, and what mine used to be. And, outside of context of environment of what you're brought up in right. um in a lot of ways they're just as oppressive and just as ridiculous right right um and that was a big eye-opening experience for me last okay. night yeah, yeah yeah the the realization that it's it's just easy it's easy to be in to just be in something right yeah. i mean it's easy mm-hmm. to just get sucked into something Absolutely. or to, to, to see the world through that through a lens you know and and I guess there's some shame in that because I feel fooled. I feel like a you know a lot of lies and stuff took away you know many years of my life. Right. But also there's an empowerment of recognizing that as well of knowing that I did get out and I'm able to help others and right. um, that's just going to have to be part of my story for the rest of my life. Right. Shame though, you know, like yeah, everybody has a thing you know what i mean Absolutely. everybody's been in a relationship that was obviously toxic or everybody's like believed something about themselves or somebody else or about god or you know the universe or whatever that's totally ridiculous in hindsight and we've mm-hmm. all you know we've all been there and it's like you know it's if you feel shame that's acknowledge it and, and and you know understand it but like you also don't have to you know what i mean right right it's that's a healing where, process it's all of us Absolutely. Crazy times. I, uh, I, you know, watching King of Queens in the nineties, I never would have thought that, uh, <laughs> that the, the wife of, of Doug Heffernan would, uh, would enlighten us all one day, but that's just, she's amazing. That yeah. She was such a badass. Um, even as a Scientologist, she questioned a lot of rules and she, would, I mean, the book's called troublemaker cause that's exactly who she is. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the, the, the last sentence of it was basically now all to you other troublemakers out there just carry on are you a troublemaker brady i'm a troublemaker i think i'm a troublemaker too yeah that's why i took over this show <laughs> that's why we have this show because we're troublemakers. Yeah, we're, we're here to stir up 
to serve some trouble. The question, the norms, and to keep isn't on that asking what questions. trouble is, right? Like, yeah. Just taking, just stepping outside of what is quote unquote acceptable at a given time. It's interesting to say because Leah said also in it, um, there are if you look at some aspects of Scientology, you know the the self awareness, the empathy, um, all these different things. We could say the same about Christianity. You know, the loving them, your neighbor as yourself, and and all of these that are kind of like the practical, um, interpersonal practices of that religion. Mm-hmm. You would look at them and say, well, those those are good things. Uh, but mm-hmm. Leah said like. Um, her problem was that she saw the corruption inside of the church Mm -hmm. and it wasn't supposed to be how it was, but she said at the end, even if it was the way it was supposed to be, um, she doesn't think she'd be able to support it because it is created in a way to enable some people to power and not Mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I see that a lot in just any construct of, let me put it this way. I, it is normal for people inside of a religion um, to always err on the way of supporting the people that are like them and disabling the people who are not like them. Right. Um, and that, that goes across the board and you can see it in so many different ways and so many prejudices that mm-hmm. the prejudices influence the beliefs. Um, mm-hmm. And it's very problematic. You know, um, I, I spend a lot of, I spend, especially when I was like in my sort of doubting phase, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, how personality types play into uh, beliefs, right? Uh, yeah. And, the, and there's this way that um, different, you know, per, my experience is Christian, so that's the, the level that I think on. And there's a degree to which, uh, you know, like a, a different different denominations cater to, to different personality type like if you were to just break down myers-briggs you know and yes. do one of those oh like, my god yes do one of those like harry potter you know those those like harry potter ones where it's like are you if you're an enfp you're a so and so you know <laughs> yeah, whatever you're a snape or whatever and uh yeah and it's almost like you're if you're a intj you're a you're a presbyterian you know what i mean like it's like it's almost like that to a degree like there's presbyterians are kind of like raven claws i would they say can- <laughs> Charismatic or kind of Hufflepuff. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lutherans, probably kind of Gryffindor. Right. And then uh, what is the last one? Slytherin? Oh, Catholics. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's your, the that's snakes. Your, that's your Presbyterian coming out right there. Yeah, my that, Southern Baptist, actually. That, we oh, were like, I fear for the Pope's soul. That, yeah. You know, that yeah. crazy. Oh, you but, believe in Mary. But, but seriously, mm. like there's a, um, and it, it almost, like to me that really, that really speaks to how, frail the the whole the whole doctrine is because it's just not it's not for everybody you know what i mean like there are different ideas are emphasized and it's and it's held to be this the truth right Mm -hmm. like if you're a presbyterian john calvin is you know the truth like the tulip is is true but if you're a slightly different personality than the kind of people that believe the tulip then you're like not then it's you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it doesn't fit your, it's almost like, oh, well, you're not this kind of person. So you, you go to this kind of church. And it, I think it just speaks to like, there's a, there's a mess of. No, you're, you're right. It, it's actually creepy that you mentioned this and it makes me think that you may have hacked into my email. Um, <laughs> In addition to taking over my podcast, but, uh, <laughs> no, uh, my friend Ashley that I grew up with, uh, in, at, at the church that we went to is a first Baptist church in our hometown. Um, her, we were talking about this and about how different personalities are more likely to become converted than others. And that yes, their response is exactly things, what I'm saying. Um, it, and it, it's, that it's an interesting thought. And another thing that she mentions and, and, and you may recognize this and be able to relate with it as well is that she recognized that people who really do take, who did take their faith extremely seriously end up becoming ostracized inside of the church. A lot of times there's a, like a loneliness that goes with that, that I, that I definitely experienced. Yeah. I experienced that as well. That if you take things as serious as, as they want you to, um, you're going to be extremely alone, even within your church community, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which seems very backwards. If all of them are being led by the Holy Spirit, if all of them have, you know, God literally living inside of them, changing them from the inside out, mm-hmm. um, but yet they're not recognizing, um, oh, these people who are literally taking this serious, mm-hmm. they they really are practicing what they preach. Um, and there's such a wall, there's such a divide, even within the church. It's like there's a happy medium that you you. you need to try to fit in. Right? I think that there's just some things that that some personality types 
easily dismiss in her mind. Mm-hmm. Like where I, where I was one of those that if I saw somebody who was in need, like a homeless person or something, and I felt that the Holy Spirit or God was telling me to take care of them, um, and I didn't do it, I was at not at peace until I did that. It was right. almost like an obsessive compulsive um, attribute Neat, to yeah. my personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, Brady. Yes. Um, I want to find out a little bit more about your personality. Oh, no. Okay. All right, let's do I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get in your head. I'm good, already in your head, Brady. Good luck. <laughs> good luck getting out. Uh, I'm, I'm picturing the Willy Wonka scene where he's in the boat going in that tunnel. Yeah. That's you right now. And yeah. I'm just like laughing methodically. It's like, about to get real weird. Let's do it right when after we get this. back. <laughs> uh, Brady, this is my no, show. You're sorry. Dang it. Okay, go ahead. I do the segues. All right. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear hear from... Let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd We'd love love to to hear hear from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. And welcome back. I'm still tied up here. Yeah, Brady's still tied up and I'm still running the show. (laughs) I haven't gone anywhere. And uh, so far, I think it's probably the best episode. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um Brady, I want to, uh, let's talk about, uh, the, the church you grew up in, the culture you grew up in. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm interested in that. I, and it's honestly, it's probably the least, I know the least about that, that early, like your early childhood and teens church life mm-hmm. and what that looked like. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Whenever I talk about my religious trauma and the stuff that I've gone through, um, I focus a lot on the church as this fellowship to me, but I also realized that growing up in the environment that I did, um, was probably just as harmful uh, Mm -hmm. because of my age and the environment that I was brought up in. Right. We talked a little bit about indoctrination um, in a, in a previous episode, but um, that, that plays in, that plays a lot into what, what led you down the path that ultimately led you to the church that you, you were in when you left. Yes. Right. So, so. I mean, it all, it all comes together. It all ties in. Yeah. Uh, your dad was a deacon. Yes, at your church growing up, mm-hmm. it was a it was a mega church in a suburb of St. Louis. Um, a little less than two thousand people mm-hmm. on a weekly basis. Whenever I went there, uh, and it was a Southern Baptist church. My dad was a deacon, mm-hmm. and he was. Uh, you you have a you have a tumultuous relationship with your dad, right? I mean, this is oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at this point in my life, we both kind of mutually disowned each other. Um, You're now, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, that that kind of came to a head actually on my birthday of this year. Um, he didn't do anything for my birthday or my son's birthday or my son's Christmas or my Christmas for like two mm-hmm. or three years, and I called him out on it because I, I I got him a present or something, and mm-hmm. I just said, "Hey, I don't know what your deal is. I don't know if it's because I'm gay or what what it is, um, but." you need to make a decision if you're going to be in our lives. And I said, you have a day. I gave him an ultimatum. I gave him boundaries. Um, 24 hours. And he didn't respond till the 26th hour. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Oh, maybe when I'm up there in April. And I, and I, just, and I, I said, okay, at first, but later on, I was like, you know, if it takes you anything more than a second to decide if you want to be in my son's life, I don't want you in my son's life. Um, and I don't want you in my life. I deserve better than that. I, I, I've learned to love myself. Yeah. And if you're not going to join in on that, you're not going to be part of, who yeah. I am. Um, the door is open if he changes in the future and sure. if he makes an effort. But um, up to this point, it's just been mm. it's just been me. You do deserve better. Thank you. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. But there's a wound there, big time, absolutely big wound. Um, so, so uh, what what is having your dad, the person that he is, as a as a deacon in your church, uh, growing up? What is that? What does that look like? Is there pressure to be a certain way? Are you are you trying to live up to a certain standard? Is he um, 
my my dad was I always... feel like there's a degree of hypocrisy there. Oh god, yes. Yeah. Oh, and big time. I guess I'm I guess what I'm asking is what it, what did that look like? Do you I mean is that a fair question? Like does that make sense? No, I completely understand. Um yeah, there was a lot of hypocrisy. Uh my dad was always one of those that was loved by everybody outside of our family. Um, he was great with everybody else's kids. He did like children's choir and, and, and all of these different things. Everybody just loved him because he was so charming and mm-hmm. um, uh, outgoing and charismatic. But at home was a completely, he was abusive. Mm-hmm. Um, he was physically abusive towards um, my mom. Um, I witnessed that. So that's become part of my story. Mm-hmm. Um and he was just like emotionally manipulative. Um, I remember a lot of times, like the only times that he would show affection is after an argument to try to like smooth things over, okay. you know? And right. so that, that's like a weird thing I've had to work out in my mind as well. Um, right. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, he, he cheated. He was having an affair with a coworker who eventually okay. became my stepmom, um, and denies that he did anything wrong because he says that the, the the marriage was so bad at that point that in God's eyes, he understood it and was okay with him. Okay. Having an extramarital affair. So, um, the, okay. So there's a, there's a strong degree of projecting mm-hmm. uh, your own desired attributes, whatever onto God and saying like, Oh, this is what God's like because this is what I'm like. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I've r- r- later on recognized like textbook narcissism um, okay. mixed in with religious right. whatever. Um, right. And for whatever reason, a lot of times the religious communities that I was brought up in um, are great at protecting and enabling narcissistic personalities, especially in white men mm-hmm. um, okay. that are kind of like default going to benefit from right the the belief system yeah 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 mm-hmm. right i i mean patriarchy aside uh you have the, well like it plays into patriarchy but y- y- it's so much easier for a for a white male in a suburban church of several thousand people to be a, a sort of a a petty ruler right like a yes. a king of a one man isle if you will you yes, know like, absolutely. right just like it, this is my little domain and what and I can I have some say here, right? Mm-hmm. So he was drawn to that. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, but you can't speak for him. So I can't speak okay. for him. No, Brady, you're a young kid. Um, you're still you're like six or seven at this at this church. Your dad's a deacon. Mm-hmm. Um, your your parents get divorced at some point, right? Yes. How exactly what went down there? Um, it was around Thanksgiving. My dad, uh, like we. I feel like we were in our basement. I don't know if that's true or not, but he told us that he was leaving. Um, And so then that started the whole like custody battle and all of that stuff. Okay. So it was not, it wasn't a clean break. It was like a pretty, it was horrible. It was a pretty, it was absolutely horrible. And as a kid, you, you remember that Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. My brother and I were kind of like pawns in the whole game. Um, There was one time in the winter where my coat was stolen uh, from school, from the locker room, and it was in the middle of the winter, and my parents got like an, a week long argument over whose turn it would be to have to buy me a new coat. And because they couldn't get along, I just didn't have a coat. <laughs> yeah. And so it was just, yeah. it was very ugly. It was constant manipulation and right. um, passing messages back and forth and, and, and all and, this stuff. And pretty selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I, on both of their parts. Um, you know, I, as a kid, I'm, I'm working off of memory of when I was a seven year old, Right, right. you know, right. there's certain things that I do know for sure happened. And I was able to confirm that, um, one way or another, but, um, uh, it's really hard to know people's motivations and their actions, especially now as a 31 year old who also went through divorce. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, um, it puts things in perspective. It puts things in a little different perspective. Right. Um, speaking of, speaking of that, actually, um, I remember when I was a kid and a, a, a Christian, um, you know, indoctrinated in Christian beliefs, it was like divorce was sort of this, this important sort of like big word, right? I mean, it, it had a lot of, it had a lot of things attached to it, ideas attached to it. Um, as a, a looking back as a kid and and I guess those years following that divorce, um, do you feel like uh, the churches that you were a part of uh, had a, a particular 
attitude like were you different oh god yes oh my god yes um sorry to mean to jump on that but it, no, it was, it was yeah. over there was i remember very specifically there was this woman who she was an elderly lady who she wasn't even that old she was probably in her 50s or 60s she just seemed a lot older than she was because of my age um and whenever my my mom introduced me to her she jokingly said oh so this is the reason you got a divorce Wow. To me, like as it was a joke, like, ha ha, you're seven and you can't mentally, you know, go like, you know right. what I mean? But there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain there as a seven year old <laughs> yeah. too. And it's like, what and do I, you mean? Lady? I was just like, like, is that funny to you? Like, right. you know, and in addition to that, there was a, there was a group of, uh, like divorced and remarried women or whatever. And this is before my mom got remarried, I think. Um, and she was sitting with another woman who, had a similar situation and this other woman who is still married came up to them and had a question for my mom and this other woman. Um, and this was at a Wednesday night dinner, uh, and then said jokingly quote unquote, Oh, well I better get going. Cause I don't want anybody to think that I'm having problems with my husband because uh, she was talking to right. two and like, and, and yeah. I guess that's just like yeah. their sense of humor, but, and I don't want it to be the anecdotal that it's like, Oh, I've got these stories of these people, um, and so this is a representation of the entire faith, but there, there comes a point where when you have so many stories yeah. from so many different churches yeah. and so many different experiences where Christians have this idea of like, um, well, they're not a real Christian or, you know, they start putting quotations mm-hmm. around Christian, like, mm-hmm. oh, but they're a quote Christian unquote, mm-hmm. and where, where it's easy to like ebb and flow and choose who you're going to, who's going to represent your ideology and who's not depending on their merits of each story. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like that's, there comes a point where it's like you, you, you can't do that anymore. If, if this is what those people believe they need to take responsibility. Um, right. Well, and, and, and you know, that, that actually plays right into sort of what I was thinking about divorce in churches there's this, there's this single mom, right? It's not so much the single dad. And it's almost like because you didn't follow quote unquote God's plan and got divorced, you, whatever is wrong in your life is just a result of that, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a stigma and it, it, it really hurts the person because you're, you're effectively saying like, like it, like it, it's. I think it's harder for church people to help divorced moms because they have this belief that it's like their fault. Do you the, feel like that? I mean, y- do you, yeah. I mean, I experience that as as a dad. Um, I think that it is worse with with women because you're adding also onto that the whole concept of patriarchy, right? Um, but yeah, absolutely. There there is an element of when your life gets to a certain way where it's not, you can't just re press reset and fix all of it yeah that there is this attitude of like well this is your cross to bear or these are right these are the the um these are the results that you just have to deal with these are the the consequences for whatever's gone yeah. on yeah and it's i feel like you just help just help the person right i mean you could see the same with like homeless people and all this there's always the attitude of like well they did something to get there and that's not always the case Mm-hmm. It's it's the um, the, the mm-hmm. xenophobia the other thans mm-hmm. when somebody is not mm-hmm. the same as you mm-hmm. you're gonna err on the side of well they did something wrong because they're not like me mm-hmm. or or when you're on the other side of that fence and you're like oh well they're a screw up like me mm-hmm. and you put yourself in this category of of screw ups and then shame plays plays in and, and I has do that. this voice of yeah. Oh well, I'll never get there because I'm on this side. That's a thing I have to I have to watch. Well, myself you were on. a divorce kid. I was a divorce kid, and the last and thing you I learned from a from young age life. that you're on the wrong side of the of the fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it was the last thing I ever wanted in my life. And then so when <laughs> divorce happened to me uh, in my marriage, then it was it was kind of like a a double whammy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So young Brady. Mm-hmm. Growing up in a broken family, um, your dad is probably a narcissist or something to that le- to that degree, mm-hmm. undiagnosed. You are immersed in church culture, and and you're an outsider, and you you're growing up in that environment. 
But Brady is also gay. Yeah. Young Brady is gay. Yeah, I started to realize that when I was like probably 13 or 14. Right. What did that look like? <sighs> so, I mean, first off, I, I wanted more than anything to be as godly as I could. Um, I, I felt that God got me through my parents' divorce. That was a huge thing in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and... So and even then, I, I was like very much like a zealot, and that is like not a negative zealot, but just I was very committed. Is what I'm trying to say. And it, I I don't want to interrupt your your flow here, but You're fine. Um, an important thing for me was realizing sort of that moment where I where I realized that I was a committed Christian, and it wasn't just my parents' thing, and it wasn't just because I was in church. Do you remember like what? Do you remember how old you were when you were like, "This is what I'm doing. Like this is what I'm into." Um. After my parents had put me to bed, I would stay up and I did like a church service in my mind every night where I would sing certain praise songs to God. Um, and I would, I did that like at the age of nine or 10, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that, Mm -hmm. that commitment and that dedication started really early for me. Mm -hmm. It was the most important things in my life. Um, but I think that like when I realized that, you know, my faith is my own and it's different than what I was brought up with was probably 17 or 19, okay. like between 17 and 19. Cause I took, um, I don't know if you remember this from when we were younger, but I took like a, a year off. I was working at a Christian bookstore and I stopped reading any book, but the Bible, oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I went through that whole thing and really came out with a different theology and everything than what I was brought up with. Right. Um, so I think that's, yeah. I and I, I, I remember like, knowing you during that, during that time, that transition and, Mm-hmm. I heard you say that and I was like, oh, that's cool that he's doing that, you know? Yeah. It's so rad. Um, but it, it strikes me that, that, uh, at, you know, nine, nine, ten, that you're thinking God, a sen- like a, the sentence, God got me through my divorce. Yeah. Like coming even from like a 12 year old is a really kind of, a, it's an advanced, like kind of an adult thought. And I feel like you were just launched into like having to, to carry your own. And I think it was also, <sighs> a lot of people would come up to me even at that age and be like, you're going to go places in your life. Like you're going to do great things for the kingdom. Um, and there was a certain amount of acceptance and encouragement that I got through that, that I wasn't getting at home from either, either home. Uh, (laughs) Um, and so I think that kind of helped me in that trajectory of continuing in that, in that direction. Uh, but it was, it was a nurturing environment. And, yeah. and home wasn't necessarily not always right um but but i realized i was gay probably when i was like 17 i have a brother who's older than me um mm-hmm. he handled my parents divorce very poorly he mm-hmm. um got in with the wrong crowd started doing drugs was out of jail a lot and but he, he would when he was four years older than me so when i was like in second grade he was in sixth grade and i very specifically remember a time um in the hallway at, in my elementary school that he walked by me and called me a faggot in front of my teacher and i and i kind of looked up to him like did you hear that and she just like kind of ignored it um but that mm-hmm. was my brother was a bully and so he was constantly calling me gay he was constantly calling me mm-hmm. a faggot a wuss or whatever um so that was imprinted in my mind and so when mm-hmm. i was about 14 Um, and you know, my dad had, uh, my dad was a computer programmer or whatever. So every room had a computer. I started to get curious about things and I started going towards wanting to look at men. Mm -hmm. And, um, I told myself at that time it was because my brother had called me that for so long that I just started to believe it. So I told myself in my mind that, um, maybe he's right. Maybe I am gay. And so my, Mm -hmm. my natural inclination was to look at men. Um, but I, but I tried to counteract it with looking up female pornography as well and hoping that somehow that would counter that would like change your fix my balance or something right yeah yeah you know there's there's so much to that because you were a kid with you know probably i'm guessing not a lot of exposure to sex education none whatsoever right and there's this thing in church culture where it's like oh well they're not ready they're only 12, they're only 13, they're mm-hmm. only 10, they're only 11. We did get something maybe my junior year of high school. Um, they Which finally acknowledged it for one Sunday late. morning. Late. Yeah. And you are a, a, a young kid. You are having these sexual feelings, and not only sexual feelings, but like sexual feelings that are outside of what is culturally the norm. considered right. normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
you're just coming up with explanations. You're like, oh, well, my my brother called me gay, or like your your culture is telling you, well, your your mom is overbearing, or your dad was. Well, my dad brought those up um, because there there was a time that uh, my my dad. I guess he, he checked my computer history cause I didn't know how to do all of that back then. Um, right. Yeah. God bless me. You <laughs> right. know, a little like 16 year old, like I don't know how to cover my tracks. Yeah. Um, but I, I walked in from, after he picked me up from school, I walked in in my room, um, and, in all of my, the windows were open up on my computer of my, of what I had been looking at. Yeah. And so I walked in and there was this just moment of panic and my dad came in behind me and it was almost like a, well, 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 look what we got here. Things like, like he trapped gotcha. me. Yeah. He got me. Um, that is, and I was so ashamed by that. And, yeah. um, and, but, but I mean, at very, at first I was defensive, but another part of me was like, you know, this, I saw it as an opportunity. I was in high school at this time. Um, I was an opportunity, it was an opportunity for me of knowing that I didn't want to go down this way. I didn't want to be gay. I didn't want to, you know, look at pornography because it was sinful. And so I, I thanked him. I said, I'm glad that you found this because mm-hmm. uh, I need help. Um, and he's, he explained to me that there's two reasons people become gay, either a, either a, like a overbearing mother or a, um, not involved father, mm-hmm. which honestly, in some ways I had both. both of those things, but he, he pinned it on my mom yeah. and blamed her for the reason that I was the way that I was. Right. Yeah. It was very bizarre. And all that came from Christian counseling the Christian philosophy at that time and Christian yeah, psychology. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, that's very, very normal. I mean, sadly a very normal way for him to react as a, as a Christian, which is strange as hell. I mean, yeah. if you're going to say that the reasons that somebody becomes gay is because of bad parenting, then why aren't the parents being shamed? Why are the, why are the homosexuals mm-hmm. being shamed? Mm-hmm. And uh, people have this attitude of like, uh, why didn't it choose to be this way? And they would say, okay, well that's very, that could be very much the truth, but you chose to act on it. Mm-hmm. And whatever the equivalent of that is, of like having this natural inclination towards homosexuality or whatever, uh, whatever that, that the equivalent of that in their life, they're not doing it. You know what I mean? Like they're not keeping themselves from it, whether it's pornography or lying or gossip or whatever. Um, there's a complete double standard when it comes to homosexuality. Um, and it's, it's politicized. That's what it Mm -hmm. is. It's not any any sexual sin in general, but especially, especially homosexuality. Quote unquote sexual sin. Yeah. Brady, there's a lot there. Yeah. Lone alone Brady with his with his sexual feelings and his <laughs> and his uh and his split parents and his I feel like you're just you oh, just Oh my god, I've got a story to tell you after the break. Oh. Oh my god, yeah. This is my show, talk about so this? so I'll decide. I'll talk about it. Okay. After we get back, um Brady's gonna share it, a story with us, and I don't know what it is yet. You don't. We're it's, gonna find out together. I don't think I've ever told you this before. What's a new one? Yeah. Stay tuned. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. (laughs) We We have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org. Or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. And we are back on the uh, Hostile Chuck Parson uh, takeover episode of The Life After. Um, We're going to remove Brady's duct tape right now. Okay. Okay. Thanks thanks for letting me speak, sir. It was it was a peaceful five minutes there. <laughs> yeah. um, Brady, before the break, you uh, you told me you were going to tell me a story that oh, I you don't think I've heard. Uh, okay, so we were talking about reasons that people give um, to justify the existence of homosexuals, right? I, I think that's the only way the word at um, overbearing parents, or whatever. The the other the other popular philosophy is that they didn't have. Um, enough good Christian guy friends that there was a, a guy friend oh. lacking. Yeah. So that was a big thing that, that I heard a lot. So I, I prayed a lot uh, that God would, would provide that. Um, a good, oh, I remember you mentioning that. Yeah. yeah so I, where I grew up, like all the, the kids that were in my grade, like in, in church and everything, even though it was a bigger church, the majority of them were girls. Um, 
And there were a couple of guys that just didn't really care that much about the faith. And so it was because I really, really did. Uh, I, I, I didn't fit in very well and mm-hmm. they all went to like this private mm-hmm. school together and I didn't. So, yeah. um, and finally I, I did find like a good long-term Christian guy friend. You did. I did. Um, and this was kind of around the time that I met you. Okay. I got to know you. So college ish. College, yeah. So I, I had my my first my first love, my first like girlfriend. Um, oh. And and you know her. Uh, yeah. And then we broke up because she didn't want to have a boyfriend here when she went to college. A, a and far you away. did. I was yeah. I was, I'm just kidding. I loved her. It wasn't. Um, it was. It, it was, wasn't that time yet. It was like high school love. Right. Okay. If you're listening, you can just call yourself. Uh, she started getting close to who was my good, my good godly guy friends that mm-hmm. I feel God, you know, gave mm-hmm. me and all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they started to secretly date. Um, secretly. Well, yes. That's he, a, that's a pretty youth groupy churchy thing. To he do. lied about it when I asked him about it three times. It was like a whole Peter Jesus oh, situation. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three and times then, denied. And then finally it came out and she was upset at him for not telling me because he was supposed to and all this stuff. But anyway, I took it very, 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 very hard. And it wasn't until later that I realized why I took it so hard. It was because I lost her um, to him, but I also lost him to her. Uh, and so with dealing with my homosexuality, um, I didn't realize that my feelings for him were outside of the norm of a friendship, oh, oh. that as much as I was in love with her, as I thought in high school, I was actually in love with him as well. Uh, and so it's kind of like this double whammy. Wow, um, yeah. and it really, it hit me hard. Yeah. Um, and them being mutual friends, I mean, you understand the situation and who they were and mm-hmm, everything mm-hmm. at that time. So, um, that was a really difficult thing because it was like, I, I finally felt like God was listening to my prayers and then I was trying to do a positive thing. But uh, even through that, um, the identity of myself that I was trying to keep at bay, um, still it got its tentacles out and grabbed on to more things and destroyed them in my life, you know? Because maybe we're not made to hold that kind of thing back. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and by maybe, I mean ab- absolutely 100%. Right. Yeah. I mean, so it, it was just all these different reasons that people were giving me a while I was gay came back still to my own detriment one way or another, even though I was trying everything I could to do to, to do the right thing. But it was also right. during that time that I was finally being able to be open with people. Um, I My biggest secret in the world is people that don't know that I was attracted to men. But um, I, I started having a friend group and people that were a little bit more understanding. And I told them, hey, here's something that I struggle with. You know, I struggle, the struggle with these thoughts. Or quote, unquote, struggle, struggle, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's such a popular, the most popular phrase, you know, that I would hear growing up is struggle with same sex attraction. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's mm-hmm. like such a trigger for me now that mm-hmm. um, that's, that's, that's how I was labeled. That was my identity was a, a struggler with same sex attraction. Right. Um, and it felt like my identity a lot of times was kind of melted down to just that one pillar. Right. Brady, I, I I get this sense of there's this theme in your story where I just feel like Brady is alone. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, growing up, um, your parents are doing their thing. My brother, they're fighting. Yeah, my brother was in out of jail. Yeah. Um, or I mean, like out of everyone to understood my situation most would have been him. Yeah. Um, but so much attention was on him and, you know, pouring over these thousands and thousands of dollars to get him out of jail and, uh, for his rehab and, you right. know, and all of that. So there was so much attention on him and, um, yeah, I, I think loneliness is definitely a very common theme in my life. And you're navigating some really difficult, I mean, really difficult is an understatement, right? I mean, sexuality, religion, uh, marriage, family. You're figuring all of this out, and you're just sort of on your own. Yeah. Like you have the church, but the church isn't really addressing what you need. They're trying to, they're too busy catering to ideals, I feel like. Putting Band-Aids on it. and Right. Right. Like, oh, well, that's not a complete family. So let's not focus too much on that. Uh, let's, let's instead, let's teach what the, what the ideal family looks like. 
And then, and then the church I ended up getting disfellowship from had such an emphasis on families because um, they were, you know, very reformed, very Calvinistic, um, and very Presby- Presbyterian, even though they were Southern Baptists. They had a mm-hmm. lot of Presbyterian things, but they had such an emphasis on large families that, uh, you know, where the dad, you know, would lead them in worship and stuff at home, and they would have daily worship services. There was, it was normal to have a family of six children to eight children, Um the majority of the people who were there were part of these large, large families Mm -hmm. or families where they would have, you know, this very close knit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And then there was just like a sprinkle of us, like lost boys basically. So you, uh, you started to, to sort of, uh, I guess deconstruct the, the, the church culture you grew up in. Uh, when you're in you know, 18, 19, mm-hmm. right? You started uh, you reading, you, you read the Bible, you stopped reading outside sources. You just read the Bible for a year. Yes. And you started, you started developing your own system of beliefs. Is that this, is that why you decided to go to this church, the church that you would ultimately get disfellowship? disfellowship to yeah. Start? Yeah. So I was, I was youth pastoring at that time. Okay. Um, I was youth pastoring. And then uh, the church that I was at was uh, ideologically not, not, matched up with me i remember the pastor pulled me up i remember to the side you were once. really concerned with that yeah the pastor pulled me up to the side once he's like brady um we're really concerned that you're you're all about the bible and not about planning activities <laughs> <laughs> hey i feel like he was on to something in hindsight i know right and you know me with being so theologically minded and like i wanted to teach these kids and i was like yeah um, I'm, I'm still friends with some of the people that I, that, that was in my youth group. And, right. and I, I feel that there's still like a, a common mutual respect there, but, um, I wasn't just about like, Hey, let's all go miniature golfing. You know, I wanted to, right. um, take the book of Ephesians and teach it verse by verse and yeah. really figure out what was being taught there, et cetera. Right. Uh, but that wasn't part of what that ideology wanted. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I took, took the time out and then I decided that it would be best for me to go to just go to a church and be part of it. Um, one that reflected my ideology. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point I came out more as like, um, uh, like a, a John Piper, uh, oh, you know, yeah. uh, Calvinistic Southern Baptist, oh, I or I think would, he's a different type of Baptist, but we would butt heads over G- yeah, you and I did back then. John Piper so hard. Oh man, yeah. I never. I I think I liked John Piper for like two months, and I was like, mm, never mind. Yeah, yeah. That After was he life. spent like five years on the Book of Romans, I was just like, oh, oh my god, man. yeah. Oh my god, you're right. I and he frequently that. referred to it as the greatest letter, letter. ever yes. written. So Brady, it was at this church. So you you found you uh, you created you you started to carve your own path, right? as a Christian and you found your way into this church and you, sorry. I found my people. Yeah. I, I found my people there. Yeah. Of who I thought would be my family. Yeah. Cause I didn't have one. Um, why am I just understanding this in my life right now? Shit. Yeah, that's why that church was important to me. Yeah. It was it was your it was your choice. It wasn't something that was cast on you, which is I think I think everything else kind of was. Yeah. It was like you took a year. Two, yeah. Two years. And the pastor was like a father to me. We met on a weekly basis. Um and he believed in me. And, um, he ultimately was one of the ones who, who, he made the decision to disfellowship me and tell the church not to, not yeah. to have connections with me or to treat me as if I was an outsider because I questioned his authority once. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, that was hard. I mean, I was there for six or seven years. Uh, I, I finally felt like I found my people. I was I was able to be part of a friend group. Um, and then eventually I, I met my best friend, Jason, um, who, you know, finally there, it, was a, it was a very healthy friendship. 
you know, I, I wasn't like, <laughs> uh, subconsciously in love with him or anything. He was just the first time that I really actually had a real friend. Yeah. Um, and, and other guys as well, but nothing, nothing as close as Jason. He was the best man in my wedding yeah. and, and all of that. Um, and he's the one that ultimately during my divorce just passed away of sudden heart failure. Yeah. Um, which was, I think four years ago this week, it came up on my Facebook, you know, the on this day mm-hmm. thing and it, it yeah. showed up the, like a little memorial post that I wrote, wrote about him whenever he passed. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there was, there, there was a, there was a lot of loss there that I'm just now that I'm framing this with you, understanding yeah. all the implications of Brady. It's incredible that you're where you are. Thank you. <laughs> How'd you get here, Brady? Kimmy Schmidt fucking stayed in that bunker and she just kept on turning that wheel. And I think that's literally um, what my life has been is just wanting to keep on turning that wheel because I mean, when they do flashbacks of Kimmy Schmidt of when she's stuck in a bunker, you, you see her doing these things to like keep things going for the other people around them, you know, where she would, uh, she, in, in season three, you find out she had to marry the, 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 the pastor who stuck her in there. Uh, and she did that. So somebody else wouldn't have to do it. And, and I, and I think that just instinct, instinctively there's personality types and for whatever reason, I, I have that personality type that um, is just going to keep on going, yeah. and hope that eventually something clicks, and and that bunker door opens up, and they're able to walk out in the sunlight for the first time. And I think that's what I'm still hoping for. Hmm. Um, I think that it's coming um, soon, and, and I think it's it's happened in some ways. Uh, but, but I think that, but I think that there is, there's like another breakthrough coming to my life soon. I I just have this feeling that, um, some things are just going to click and make sense soon and uh, working towards that trajectory right now. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Brady, I think you're an incredible, resilient human being and hearing this story, I think all at once. I think I see it in a way I never did before. And I've always thought really highly of you, but thank you. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Yeah. So where, you, where were we? <laughs> you found your people, Brady. Yeah. You okay. thought you did. And, uh, it was in that, it was in that family quote unquote, that you would ultimately realize that, uh, everything that you had that you had built up until that point everything that that really i think was your own was maybe a lie yeah and it all kind of happened at once yeah you know because how how did it happen um well okay it was funny because at one point i was going to leave that church and go and i was thinking about moving moving to a different city that had a different church like a, a sister church that they were close to and they talked me out of it um which was probably the right thing to do because like 2 weeks later is when i met my best friend jason mm. and uh my my ex brother-in-law um and a couple other people and so they they were visiting the church and um, they had a checklist of everything they expected out of a church that was important to them. It was like from Mark Dever's like nine marks of a healthy church thing. That's intense. And okay. So yeah, I yeah. saw them with this like check mark. In fact, my friend, my friend Amanda was there and she's like, Brady, look. And she, I looked up and I saw what they were doing. I'm like, oh my God, I love these people already. Cause they care. <laughs> they care. You know, and it's like, right, finally right, right. I'm meeting somebody else who takes like this faith and everything that's my age is as serious as I do. Yeah. Um, and it Addition, like in addition to like Amanda and a couple of my other friends at that time. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just, I, I stuck and I became really good friends with them and we, we connected. And then um, my, my ex brother in law, he mentioned that he had, he had a sister um, and then she ended up coming to church and drop dead gorgeous, you know? And, and even before our first date, you know, I, I was open at this time, maybe too open about 
uh, my sexuality and my attraction and my struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because in a couple, soon we're going to interview you know, my good friend, uh, Kristen and Kristen and I went on a date at this time and it was like the most horrible date ever because in, and I'm like, Oh, hi, I'm Brady. And you know, I was like, it took like maybe an hour before I started talking about my struggle with same sex attraction. (laughs) And then I think I like tried to awkwardly hold her hand (laughs) in a Walmart parking lot. But, um, but, uh, anyway, she moved away and then she came back. So Chris and I are really good friends now. And anyway, you'll have to hear that story later. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I was very open about who I was. Uh, she revealed some things to me from her past and, uh, we just, we started dating and it was very difficult, uh, at, at times because it was clear that <sighs> we were not clicking in a way that people that were dating should click. Sure. Um, but there was still so much pressure, um, to be quiverful to be quiverful and honestly Chuck when we started to date there was so much pressure for us to get engaged I was dragging my feet um, because I think that I knew there were some issues but um, I was given an ultimatum that if I uh, by her she got this advice from our pastor that if I didn't get engaged if I didn't propose soon then then she would be right to leave me Um, and we were only engaged for over a year it wasn't even two years and so it wasn't like and i I mean that's how long as we like were dating we courted you know that that whole phrase right so there was so much pressure on that of like well you only do that if you want to get married and then uh well why are you why are you resisting that's because i saw red flags that i saw yeah growing up with some of the other people in my life that um but but i thought that was normal because we were taught that the women were the weaker vessel mm-hmm. and so that we needed to love them in the times that they were maybe irrational or whatever. But I didn't realize that the extent of what was, was happening and, and, and we were not a good fit. We were, mm-hmm. we were not a compatible fit, yeah. but I thought that that was normal because look at the, look at the house I was brought up in. Right. You know, I, 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 I was used to hearing, um, my parents yelling through the walls Mm -hmm. and then my brother and I would just go downstairs and play video games and Mm -hmm. act like it didn't happen. And I was used to going to church every week and pretending like we had this perfect home life because my dad was a, was a deacon. Um, these things that should have been red flags weren't red flags because the, the flags were just broken. I I didn't have, you didn't have a, a a healthy point of reference. I didn't have a healthy point of reference. And so, um, we, we ended up, uh, we, we, we got married, we got married yeah. and, um, it was very rocky a, a lot. Um, and we would get a lot of help and counseling and, um, professional it, secular health, help, help and counseling, right? No, no, just from our pastors oh. and other couples in our church. And it was always things of like, well, she needed to submit more and I needed to love her more. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's a simple formula. Submit. <laughs> right. It's respect and what what is it? Respect and like you talk, you shut up. You know? Yeah. And that's that's the Yeah. That's the roles. But it doesn't work that way. It didn't work that way. Right. Um because we're not robots. We're not. <laughs> and you can't just program. plug in some some words and make it happen. Exactly. But we, we did have good times. I mean, obviously I, I, I loved her. Yeah. Um, I was attracted to her. She's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so that was easy because of my sexual, yeah. <laughs> my sexual past of being attracted to men of like, right. you know, sexuality is a spectrum. And, um, even if I identify as a gay man, I can look at some women and be like, yeah, you know, I'm very attracted to her. Um, and so it felt like it was the right, it was the right fit. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Um, so we went down that road. It was, it was another answer to, to your prayer. Yeah. Maybe probably the one you repeated the most, which was make me normal. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be normal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we got married. Um, we were going to wait longer to have a kid, but we decided not to. Um, and so we, we had our son and, uh, he was about three months old. And then that's, no, we moved when he was about three months old. When he was six months old is when I found out that she 
um, had an Ashley Madison account and was cheating. Because mm. um, she was working out some stuff on her own. I didn't, it, it's not that she's a villain or a horrible person. Um, yeah. She was under weird pressure and was in a relationship she didn't want to be in. Not unlike yourself. Not unlike myself. How long have you been? How long have you been married at that point? Um, maybe about a year and a half or so. Yeah, I think we. No, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, maybe two years. I don't know. <laughs> it's all a blur to me at this point, you know. Mm. Um, but my friend Jason was always there for me. He lived across the hall, and mm. it was like a friend situation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was helpful, and I think that he had a lot of good advice and stuff. But then. Like I said, you know, he's the one that um, ended up passing away during yeah. during the divorce. I want to get back to that. Okay. When you found out she was cheating, what was where'd you go from there? You were already getting counseling. Did you just? There was it was a weird week. Um, God bless her. She was she was she was trying really hard to work through some of the stuff from her past. Mm-hmm. And um, was making some big breakthroughs, and she was opening up to me more. And then it just felt like, poof, like mm-hmm. all of a sudden there was this twist um, mm-hmm. of like different behavior. And she would spend hours and hours and hours alone. Um, and it very much could have been postpartum depression mm-hmm. um, or other things. Who knows? I'm I'm not here to psychoanalyze my ex-wife. Sure. Um, and you're not asking me to. I'm not accusing you of that. It's just that um, it was weird. There was definitely red flags yeah. of, of there, there's some strange behavior. And so, um, we had gotten an argument over something very small and she, she went off with her family and something told me that there was just something weird about her behavior. And I knew that she was spending hours and hours alone with her computer. And so I ended up finding the computer and I found out, um, this whole other email address that she had and the people mm-hmm. that she was talking to. Mm-hmm. And I found out that it was... Ashley Madison that she was speaking to another guy who was married and had his kid and they lived in California or Colorado. Um, and so I, I, I contacted her and said, Hey, I know what's going on. You need to come home. We need to talk about this. And it, and it turned into an all out just brawl, mm-hmm. uh, verbally. I mean, it, there was no hitting or anything like that. Um, but yeah, she ended up moving with her parents, and then um, a couple of days later, we were going to work things out. She came home, but I found out she was still talking to this guy. Um, and then she left for a couple months um, and came up with other reasons of why she didn't want to come home. Um, and they were kind of deflections, you know, and that's okay. But while she was gone for a couple months is whenever um, just <laughs> I was actually meeting with her dad and I had and I had a meeting with her and her in her her brother and it was more of just one of those scenes of me saying hey you know i i asked permission to be part of this family i asked permission to court your daughter but um i i don't even feel like you're talking to me um mm-hmm. or hearing my side of the story of what's mm-hmm. going on at all and so we had this conversation and uh in the middle of it we got a <laughs> we got a phone call um and my ex-brother-in-law had to leave and it was because we found out that Jason was rushed to the hospital mm. and uh, her dad opened up to me of some of the things that happened in his life. And he started to understand and be a little bit more empathetic of my situation of what was going on. And uh, we talked for like five more minutes and then we rushed to the hospital. And when we got there, uh, Jason had already died. Mm. And I, and I just broke down. I've never cried that hard of yeah. just wailing of here's all this pressure of uh of the divorce which is the last thing i've ever wanted to do and uh, there was a weird friction now between me and the church council like the, the counseling at church and and all of this and then on top of that uh my first real healthy friendship um just died while putting on swimming trunks yeah. and um after that my wife came home a couple days later uh because she she felt bad she felt guilty um but she was still talking to that guy and um that it went back and forth a couple of times and it just got to the point where it became clear we weren't we weren't going to fix this 
um, as much as the church wanted us to, and they were counseling with us. They were meet, were meeting with them every week, mm-hmm. and they were trying everything they could to like talk us into fixing things and talking her into it, and like asking me to apologize for anything I ever could have done to make her want to cheat on me, and um, right. all of this stuff as if it was somehow my fault, right. Um, or that my leadership was bad. She's or, the weaker vessel. Right. That, that was the attitude. And there was even like, how, how did they word it? Um, oh, I would, I would say, you know, I'd bring up the, the cheating, which never really got resolved. And their response was, well, well, you, you weren't a perfect husband either. And, and I'm like, then who deserves that? Right. Then who, who deserves to talk about cheating then, you know, because that's, that's a, that's a deal breaker. That's, that's a thing. Yeah. And to, to say, well, because maybe I didn't, you know, whatever fault that any, anybody can find in anybody in a, in a marriage, which you can do that to anyone. So there it was, it was manipulation. It was, it was psychological manipulation right. of like uh, trying to project things. And it, yeah. and that's where I'm like, where I was talking about the, the Leah Remney book about Scientology of how, there was so much emotional manipulation, mm-hmm. and everything. And I connected with that because I think the church of Scientology is a lot more upfront and they're more black and white with what they're doing. It's more clear to see how they were. Whereas this was more like sneaky. It was more like backhanded and passive aggressive. Well, and it's, it's rooted in, in a, your entire life of being taught that this is how it's supposed to go. You're yes. supposed to get married. You're supposed to be a leader. You're supposed to have a family. It's supposed to work. I suppose, yeah, you do this, this, and this, and uh, God will fix it for you. Or um, yes. rely on him that that if I love her like Christ loved the church, then she's going to submit. Or if she submits, then of course, then I'm going to respond back with the love. So there, there is this idea that like you, you initiate... And you just expect God to cause all of the other things to happen. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, then you just keep on going and you keep on trying, which, which you know me, I, I would continue to do now to continue to turn that wheel. I'd yeah. continue to do whatever I felt needed to be done. Um, but it just got to a point where I, she was going to file for divorce and they wanted me to stop her from doing that. And I, what, bro- couldn't. what broke the cycle of you turning the wheel? I started to lose faith in these people. Yeah. Um, and I think also my faith in God was starting to be very much shaky. Brady, you you prayed for a good friend. You lost your friend. You prayed for a community. Your community was betraying you. You prayed for a family, a wife. You prayed for what God, what you thought God wanted you to do, and it was all going under. Yeah. And there you are. And you stood up for yourself. I did. Yeah. And you had nothing to fall back on. That's incredible. That's incredibly brave. Thank you. Um, so what it came down to was um, she was filing. They wanted me to ask her to stay and beg her to stay. Um, and, I, and I said no. And I said that there was other things at play, including mental illness on my side and, and her side and whatever. Um, two days later, they went before the church I told them to speak, only refer to me as an outsider, to not have fellowship with me. And at that, (laughs) um, I lost, in addition to all of that, I lost my support, my my church family. Um, I was even, it's weird because I wasn't even actually going to that church at that time. Uh, We were we were going to a smaller church to help serve more because, Mm -hmm. and we were sent out from them. Like they had a whole ceremony of like laying hands on us and sending us out, you know? Um, but we were still very, very close to them and I still considered them my home family. Um, 
because I knew them for seven years, whereas this other church I only knew for like two or three months. Yeah. And um, I made a couple of friends at a new church. Uh, I tried to call one of them when I found out my wife was cheating. He wouldn't answer the phone, and to find out it's because he was cheating on his wife. And so it's like another one of those things where it's like, this isn't, I didn't just go to crazy ass places. I didn't go to like weird churches. It, the, the reason that these stories sound so unbelievable and strange is because I was involved in the inner circles. Yeah. Um, I can guarantee that most likely any church that you can find has stories like this. Um, yeah. I just happen to have tracked it a lot of <laughs> the really bad stories for some reason. This stuff is common. Um, these were not Westboro Baptist or anything like that. In fact, like the church I was in did counter protest against Westboro that were like very effective and very like Mm -hmm. loving and all of that, you know? So it's, I think it's easy to dismiss a lot of these churches I'm involved with and say, Oh, well, these are the extremists. But unfortunately there's so many stories like mine that, um, it's convinced me that it's not as rare as I thought it was originally. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started going to another church, like a United Methodist for a while. And then eventually I was just kind of like, I, I, I lost faith. Yeah. I couldn't do it anymore. I think that's what you needed though. Yeah. It's when I finally decided that I was going to allow myself to be gay <laughs> and the date men and just be myself when we get back we're gonna hear about how brady began to pick up the pieces and find a new way stay tuned if you were gonna die tonight do you know where stop you... just tell them about our website oh just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org yes they can go now even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> Thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right. Thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. And we're back. Um, I am still running the show. <laughs> and uh, I, ha- I, I decided to let Brady talk over the break this time. Yeah. Thank and, you, you know, much. it wasn't that bad. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate letting me um, suck on a moist washcloth uh, because I've been really thirsty. Uh, <laughs> if you were a little more Christ-like, you would have turned it away. Well, it was vinegar. Um, right. Yeah. Speaking of bad taste in your mouth, um, you are you have just left your your church it's <laughs> the best segue ever <laughs> that segue was so good it's basically like the segue that took the inventor of the segue off that cliff <laughs> you're a regular joe, we joe apo- bluth over there we apologize to the segue family if you're listening <laughs> segway family. uh brady you have <laughs> christ almighty i can't do this <laughs> Uh, Brady, that that last segment was pretty intense. Yeah, uh, there's a lot there, man. So where we left off was you you left your church family that you. Well, I mean, I didn't really have a choice, but yeah, yeah, you yeah you okay you were kicked out of your church family. Yeah, but you uh, you went on a on a bit of a journey after that for about what probably roughly a year where you were sort of navigating being a gay Christian. Um, I mean, to, to an point, like I, even before that, I, I worked with that church that disfellowshipped me with a third party representative and met with them for, um, like three months, um, mm-hmm. to figure out t- 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 until they realized, Hey, we shouldn't have disfellowshipped you and we're sorry. Um, and then it took another, another like two months for them to, uh, apologize to me publicly because they, they said that they were working out some things within their church at that time that needed more attention. Um, and it was kind of honestly in that two months, you know what? Um, that's funny. Cause we always ask what the last straw was. I honestly think that was probably my last straw it was the apology or the lack of apology. Yeah. And the yeah. fact that they, they had other things that they're working out. That's, uh, there, a, that's a good last straw. There was, a, there was a leader that they ended up having to fire, um, because of the way he treated me and some other people oh, wow. in other situations. Um, 
And so, so that's they, what they that's what they were working through. But still, I they I, weren't totally ignorant people. They were just no. I don't think anybody kind of is. Mess, I, I think right, that they right. were working within their worldview. Um, right. And and I just at this time in my life believe that that worldview is skewed because if it causes you to treat people this way, um, then it, I, I don't believe it could be true. Especially if you're mm-hmm. claiming to have the Holy Spirit of actually God communicating mm-hmm. to your soul. Um, and you're that clueless of what's going on around you. Um, that makes me question. Yeah. You're you know, supposed to have the, the fruits of the spirit as it were. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's not, that's not what that was. And it's, it's kind of seems like that's, a, that's everywhere. Right. Like, yeah. And again, like my story is not that uncommon in right. some aspects, you know, it's just, my story sounds weird because it had everything Happen at one shoved time. into two or three months of yeah. just absolute craziness. So, as we all know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, anybody that's that's left religion um, at some point in their life, it's not a clean cut. It's not a clean transition. No, never. And you had a, on, in addition to just, I, I feel like, I feel like for most people, losing your faith is coupled with another sort of tragedy right Mm -hmm. but you had this this these shambles of of the of a life that you had been living for so long and that's what you had how did you even how did you even start at that point to 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 find yourself well um it's funny you ask that because i'm going to give an answer and it's it's honest um, but it's going to sound funny. I, I downloaded Grinder, which is like the gay, yeah, you know, dating app. Um, and I started talking to to people on there, to yeah. guys, and I uh, started to like flirt with the idea of flirting with the idea, you know, right? Because um, that was the big question mark that you could finally explore, right? I mean, right? And and it scared me, like Chuck. I was so scared. Yeah. I I even told like my family, like, Hey, I'm really struggling here. I don't know what's going to happen. I was scared of my faith, like leaving. Um, I was like, I, I, I really wanted to hold on to this. And so I was, uh, I was like, I'm afraid that I'm going to start doing this or whatever. And so, um, uh, you know, okay. There was, a, there was one other story I need to tell. And that was when, um, somebody outed me to my mother, mm-hmm. which was the biggest fear of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it in a single phone call, um, my family turned against me and came up with a plan where um, I would not have my son overnight because, quote, if I didn't molest or rape him, one of my friends would um, because I was gay. So, uh, again, it was like, shit, what else, what else do you need to take away from me while I'm down here, you know? Um, yeah. and so that was like right at the same time that, you know, after my wife left and the church and everything. So I had to fight for custody of my son and the court system saw right through it. Um, and yeah. they, they fixed that situation. That was right. helpful. So th- that was hard. And so I think like after that is whenever I was just, um, I was finally starting to just like, you know what I'm going to date guys. This is dumb. Um, I'm, I'm protected in a way. Um, I know that I'm not going to lose my son because I'm gay right. uh, because it's not, 1850 anymore <laughs> right yes. um yes. so i i you know i downloaded grinder and i started dating guys and uh realized that that's my identity that's who i am um i mean i believe in you, the kinsey scale you were you were afraid of it but it ended up it ended up being yep. your, your comfort comfortable you you found a, a home there I mean, you found yeah, a, I found you a, found a sense of direction. A, you found a, a, a sense of direction. I would call it. I, mean, yeah. I want to say home. Right. Uh, the gay community is difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, weird expectations. You've got to be in perfect shape. You got to make a lot of money and all this stuff. I it feels the, like I learned but, the word homonormativity ooh, recently. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it's the it's exactly what you're saying. It's uh, the the expectation that if you're gay, that you act X, Y, and Z. You're you, going to be on Neil Patrick look, Harris. You look this way. Yeah. Uh, in your like you don't have kids mm-hmm. right um yeah yeah you yeah well, except for Neil patrick harris but it right because he also has like a you, model you hang out husband. in gay bars you mm-hmm. do these these are the activities you do this is the the way you know, that you have it's the everything. same i mean it's the same as it's it's heteronormativity but it's on a it's on a smaller scale and it's 
yeah i don't know I anything say about smaller it scale. Yeah, yeah i know what you mean though yeah it's it's different um so yeah i mean i went from like yeah trying to fit into you, you know like i mentioned at the very beginning of like uh, leah rimney talking about her book of um in her book how she was like jack skellington where he went from the the the, the halloween world to the christmas world it was almost like i went you know from like super christian to not christian to like also like my sexuality you know trying to explore that so it was like jumping to like a completely different holiday as well you uh-huh. know like i went from like halloween to um like mars new year's <laughs> you know yeah 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 i follow you it was a completely different world yeah and so i i did a lot of escapism um mm-hmm. Uh, my for for years and years and years, I was obsessed with like science fiction and television shows, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, you, I think our listeners always hear my stupid cult, pop culture references, mm-hmm. and that's that's mm-hmm. what it is. I even wrote a I wrote a novel at that time. It was about a hermit who escaped his bad childhood from uh you know escaped his bad childhood with pop culture references, and I was, right. and then after I read it, I'm like. Oh shit, that was like a therapy session. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I yeah. just wrote about myself. Right. Um and so there was a lot of that um and and so I started drinking for the first time and um experimenting with other things and, and all of that and just trying to numb myself. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't until about this week or the week before that I realized what I was numbing myself from and that mm. is there's a voice inside of my head that just repeats the same thing over and that's just this isn't how it was supposed to be. This isn't how it was supposed to yeah. be. Um, and so I, I tried to numb that mm-hmm. and to, to take that voice away of just the shame of where I am in my life mm-hmm. and what's happened in my life mm-hmm. and the otherness of it, of feeling so different than everybody, um, which is something I was always afraid of when I was growing up Southern Baptist. I mean, we're... If you're white, you're afraid of black people. If you're Baptist, you're afraid of Catholics or mm-hmm. charismatic. And if yeah. you're, you know, so there's always yeah. like this sense of otherness that you're afraid of. But now I realize that it was very, very, very different. I the mean, other. Yeah. It, it was late 20s at that time, um, divorced, single, gay dad yeah. um, who's was overweight um, and, and just didn't have a supportive family or anybody you know yeah. it's just i was another yeah i feel I, I feel like i don't that i i know that that none of that defines you right right and i feel like you're you're learning that big time. right because yeah. that is our journey as humans is to unlearn toxic things mm-hmm. we did spend a lot of time doing that um how did how did you how did you start that that process of, of unlearning. One thing that I did for myself out of self love and self care is I put myself through therapy. Yeah. Um, I started seeing a therapist. It was, it was actually at a time that I lost my job um, because I was quote distracted during the time that my best friend died and I was going through my divorce and everything. Yeah. It was in my job of six years. So I was let go. And then I had like a series of like really bad jobs that like, um, they would fire people right before their benefits would start. Um, or I worked for, a um, a couple in their nineties that had dementia and were still trying to run a company. And like, I got fired over a dementia episode where they didn't know what was going on. Just really bizarre things like that, you know? So it just felt oh like God. so much shit was raining down on me. Um, but I, I was like, you know what? I was on unemployment, but I'm like, I still need to go to therapy. So I contacted a friend of mine. She referred me to a therapist. She worked for a Lutheran organization, even though they weren't really religious, but I wasn't sure. comfortable with that just because of where I was leaving and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I ended up getting a atheist, uh, therapist and met with him on a weekly basis. And it was pr- one of the best things that's ever happened to me by far. I, it's kind of funny. I actually, res- I actually did the opposite when I left the faith as I went to see a, a Christian counselor, but I went to see a Christian counselor that I, that I knew based on who referred me would be a, an actual, actually a good counselor, right? Like yeah, a yeah, yeah. psychologically sound counselor. Um, because I didn't know if I could find a secular therapist that would understand the culture that I was coming out of. <sighs> That's smart. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's either or like, you know, therapy is therapy and it's, it's going to be helpful, but 
uh, that was just the way sort of that I did it. So, <sighs> well, you know, a, a Christian counselor helped me a lot too. Yeah. Okay. Now that I, uh, it was at the end of my marriage, um, whenever I, I put my foot down and said I wasn't going to go have the church do our counseling anymore, we went to a professional. And it was during that time that he first introduced me to the phrase um, spiritual abuse. And I realized that uh, where I was in the, in the church that disfellowshipped me, that was very much spiritually abusive. Um, and so that was like a big breakthrough for me. I read a book on it and everything. And so I have to give him credit as well. I think he was uh, the first person to really show me empathy. In yeah. fact, I think he's the one who taught me the word empathy, which oh, sounds wow. crazy. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, wow. So that was a huge deal. And I, and I really do respect him a lot for that. Uh, would you have been able to, to start to start to rebuild your life without therapy? Do you think? Not healthily. Right. Is that a word? Healthfully. Yeah, sure. Um, it would not have been able to do it in a healthy manner. <laughs> right. There we go. Um, probably yeah. not. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, because, you know what my biggest problem was? I was always taught if I was having a, th- a lustful thought about a man to change my, to change my mind, think of something else. If I, um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it was the same for run, for flee from sin. Right. You know, um, he's the, the devil is probably like a lion. So you need to run away from it and any, anything. So that, that was the mindset. That's how I, that's how I dealt with my problems mm-hmm. is, is to change my mind really quickly and then feel shame over what was in my mind. Uh, um, whereas his, his, his advice to me and his therapy was to allow negative thoughts to go through. You listen to them all the way through, you let them air out. And then you, um, you make the decision after listening to them. Is this productive? Is this what I want my life to look like? Is this in the same path that I'm on? And if it's not, then you reject it. And if there is like a negative thought that you have of yourself that might be constructive, um, that could be constructive if you've listened to parts of it, um, then you, you accept that and then you, you yeah. get rid of the rest. So that's, that, cool. that's, I had to change the way that I, I literally had to change the way that I thought and the way that I processed my, my, my emotions and, yeah. and all of that. Um, and so that, that helped me and I still struggle with it. It's mm-hmm. not a, it, it, feeling shame about what you think is an insane thing that, that I think most people that grew up in church have to deal with. Yeah. Because you're just thinking it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're not doing anything. Well, growing up, I think the, the popular belief is even if you had these homosexual thoughts, then you were gay. You were a, you know, right. you were a faggot. You were one of those. I had a lot. I had a, I had a, yeah, several, when I was a youth leader, kids would, would ask me like, oh, does this mean I'm, I'm gay? Like I have these thoughts or I have these feelings, you know? And I didn't really know how to answer that then because uh, I was raised in church and the you're completely ill-equipped to... You're just scared to death of anything that has to do with gays. Or sex. Honestly. Or sex, yeah. For that matter. Um, so... But later on, you know, in other faith communities I had, it had a little bit more sense of like, well, no, mm-hmm. it's not a it's not a sin to think that way. But it, right. but then where I lost them is when they'd be like, well, it's an act. It's it's a sin to act on it. Right. You know? And, and again, like I said before, like, okay, you're having me having to sort of deny an entire part of my being and my existence. Yeah how are you doing that? Like, what is your equivalent to that? And you tell me how you are taking half of your thoughts or more than that and how you're rejecting them. Yeah. But you, you're, you're not, and you can't because it's who you are. It's what you're wired to be. Uh, Brady, I was thinking about this story and I I honestly don't even know if you would remember this. It was a pretty random encounter that we had where we hadn't seen each other in probably the better part of a year, maybe a couple of years. Honestly, it was, uh, I think I was, it was shortly after I got married. I'm not entirely sure, but, um, I met with you at a Starbucks in the County for some reason. And, yeah. Uh, we, back when it was cool to go to Starbucks, I don't really know what that was about, but, <laughs> um, we met at the Starbucks and we had a, we had a, a kind of a heart to heart for a couple of hours just, just to catch up. Did we plan on meeting together or we just run into each other? I don't remember. I'm not entirely sure. We, maybe we just ran into each other. That would be even weirder because it was in North County. I don't know if we planned on meeting or not, but okay. we talked for a while. And in that conversation, you brought up your, your quote unquote struggle with homosexuality. Oh, damn. Or with attraction same-sex to Same-sex attraction. I, yeah. I struggle with same-sex attraction. Lord. What you said. Um, and, you know, we always had pretty intense conversations. Like, it was always kind of to the point, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We didn't cut We didn't like talk about the weather or anything it was like no <clears throat> it was like i've been reading this theological book and it's <laughs> you know blah blah blah. um and you were kind of i don't remember exactly like why this came up or anything but 
you you mentioned that you struggle with same sex attraction, and you said, uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if you know this or not, but I struggle with same sex attraction, and then you said, uh, you know, it's not like. Uh, it's my, you know, my, and you know, I could, I could try and blame my dad. Like he was like abusive and he was like distant, emotionally distant. And my mom was overbearing or whatever, but it's my own damn fault. Shit. And I remember sitting there thinking, and I was like way more liberal than you at that point, you know? And I didn't want to like, I didn't feel like it was right to push you at that point on that, you know, on that issue. Uh, like the timing just didn't seem right. I really wanted to, um, but I, but I, I was just like, like I just felt this like, like I was in a ton. I was like had tunnel vision for a second almost. It was like, did he just like blame himself for his, for his sexuality? Shit. And, and it, 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 I don't know. It hit me, and, and I, I forgot what you said after that because it was just like, oh man, this poor dude like Hmm. this poor guy is like carrying this yeah and and now we're here and i'm listening to you uh tell your story Hmm. with all of this all of this betrayal all of this abandonment um all of this loss um, a lot of things that would make people give up hope. Um, a lot of things that uh, would push people to the very limit of what they can handle and maybe beyond that. And uh, I'm seeing you learn to love yourself. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And I'm seeing you learn to love that, that part of yourself. Um and just man you've to say that the to say look how far you've come is an understatement you know you're right thank you it's like that wasn't but 6 7 years ago maybe probably around that yeah and here you are you're out <laughs> you're you're yourself yeah you've learned to stop blaming yourself for things that are not your fault. Um, you've learned to accept this massive part of yourself that everyone in your life was telling you was wrong for so long. And, uh, you fought this incredible battle and I'm just so proud to sit across this table from you and have this conversation, you know, and to have known you this whole time. I think you're a pretty remarkable individual. Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, there's so much shame in all of that shit. I was taught to have so much shame, you know? Yeah. Which is funny. It, I, anytime I think of shame, I think of Brene Brown. Um, yes. You've been telling me about the this. sociology researcher that I'm obsessed with in her books and her Ted talks and, right. and all of that. Um, I'm reading one of her, or I'm listening to one of her audio books. Did you hear me try to lie again? Or I was like, Oh, I'm reading one of her books, but honestly, I just <laughs> <laughs> listened to an <audio> book, <laughs> which is completely legitimate. You're learning, from especially me. the podcasters. Come on. Um, and she talks so much about shame. Um, and the difference between shame and guilt, guilt is feeling bad about something you did. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. Yeah. And, uh, there was just so much shame that religion caused me to have about myself. That was so unnecessary. Shame I'm convinced is, is an underlying truth in almost every Christian teaching. And a lot of people would object to that really strongly because the, Christian doctrine teaches grace and mm-hmm. forgiveness and a lot of that rhetoric makes it seem like shame is out of the picture but I know from experience and I know from how I felt growing up and I know from how I felt the day that I decided that I didn't believe mm-hmm. the Christ- in Christian doctrine anymore that 
the inherent idea of a God that made you to be a certain way and that you'll never be that way makes everything shameful. My God, I've never thought of it that way. That like, I didn't choose to be gay, but I was gay the entire time. But I was being told not to be gay and that there would be hell to pay if I was gay. Yeah. Um, but really just replace everything I just said with gay, with sin. That yeah. you're you're born a sinner. You can't sin. You're not supposed to sin. But if you are, there's hell to pay. And yeah, there's the grace and forgiveness of Christ. But if you're not repenting fast enough, if you're not, if your yeah. life's not changing enough, you don't have enough fruit of the Holy Spirit, then, you know, like, yeah. are you really saved? Can you really, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, you're constantly aware that you are doing it wrong. Whether it's those thoughts mm -hmm. that you're supposed to, that you're supposed to, Dismiss, dismiss. Not, yeah, like, don't dwell on them. Don't dwell on them. Ignore as quickly as possible, or it's before they turn to lust. And you know, it's even like, uh, oh, am I giving enough of my income away? It's, am I, you know, am I helping other people enough? Am I cursing too much? Am I, you know, taking care of my body? It's everything. I mean, it's literally everything, and it's there, and it's just, it's so ugly, but it's so hard when i try to explain this to christians people that are really still in the faith it's like i'm speaking mandarin like they don't get it because the rhetoric is so strong on the opposite direction in the opposite direction wow. and i'm just like no you don't understand how how ashamed of yourself you are until you let go of the idea that everything is supposed to go a certain way Wow. Um, so it wasn't, it was a while ago that I, I did finally hang out with some of my Christian friends again. And, and it was not long until conversations like that came up of like, um, I feel that there's still a lot of my Christian friends that I had before. I still feel like they can open up to me about things that are going on. In fact, I feel like some of them kind of used me as a springboard to complain about things in their church because they didn't really have anybody else they can explain it to. And so, because I didn't go to their church, you know, I was kind of a good mm -hmm. <laughs> um, listening ear for that. And yeah, there was definitely an element of that, of like hearing these conversations that I haven't had to listen to for years and to hear them again. And it was just like, wow, that was part of my culture on a regular mm -hmm. basis of, um, I'm not reading the Bible enough. I don't feel like I'm loving yeah. my wife enough. Um, or even just like circumstances of, I remember, I remember for a while I had a, a female boss and some of the people at my church were not, were not accepting of that. And they oh. felt that I should have found another job and, God, and just stuff like that. Where that it's is like, ins that is insane. um, just really bizarre things of, um, or when it comes to relationships, like, do you meet our standards, like to marry our daughter or to do whatever, you know, there's just all of these things that you feel like you're constantly having to improve yourself and to, to get into their graces. Yeah. Um, but you're never going to be good enough because they don't feel that they're good enough and they're projecting it upon you. Ooh. And, that's where all of this shame is coming from and like listening and reading Brene Brown and just understanding shame and vulnerability and transparency. Um, I mean, that was a big thing whenever I was like, Hey, let's do a podcast. I just yeah. realized we're going to have to be hella vulnerable to each other yeah. and really just yeah. tell these nitty gritty, disgusting parts of our stories yeah. because I hope that somebody else who's listening is going to understand that mm -hmm. And that it's going to cause them to be vulnerable because where vulnerability is, there's healing yeah. um, because you're no longer hiding anything. You know, I, I think of like um, those, those dogs that are just like new mothers and they're malnourished puppies and they hide the puppies until the, the dog finds somebody that they know they can trust. And then the dog leads the humans back to, you know, where these, these puppies are hiding. And, yeah, and, it's, yeah. <laughs> and there's an, there's a moment of like, just emotional connection with this animal that like you chose me and you trusted me enough to see this uh -huh. and to take care of your babies. Um, and that's in a weird way what I feel like huh. I had to do yeah. and what um, I want to encourage our listeners to do. I, like I said before, I, I hear that voice in my mind saying, this isn't, this isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't how it's supposed to be. Um, but this is one of the first times where I said, yeah, that's right. But, Plan B is usually better than plan A because it requires more creativity and more 
um, of, of ups and downs and like the Phoenix rising, you know, it's, it's, I'd rather come out of the ashes than I would just to never have gotten my feathers dirty. Sure. Yeah. I'm glad you're on this journey with me, by the way. Thanks for letting me run this, run this episode. I did. Hey, it was called a hostile takeover. All right. I, I mean, didn't really have that hey, much of a choice. You, uh, just because I tied you to a chair, <laughs> put duct tape over your face. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know why you duct taped my just hair. Just because I have snipers out front. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing with us, Brady. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening. Can I say goodbye to everybody? Yeah. Listeners. Thank you very much for joining us in this super long episode of the life after, um, take care of yourselves. Um, therapy, Brene Brown books, uh, whatever it is. I, Oh, definitely read troublemaker by Leah Romney. Thank you so much for listening. Um, love each other, take care of each other and yourselves. And, uh, we'll see you next time. Smell you later. After processing that story with a lot of my friends, my therapist and Chuck, I started to rebuild and understand more things about myself. When I first started this project, what I wanted to do is to go to different people and to be able to find myself in them, to be able to rebuild myself after talking to people that I knew from my past. I want to thank you for being on this journey with me. I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. (laughs) 